Gamers, I hold before you the cutie pie shaker. It's now available. So I make a cool effect. This is my favorite one so far. Nice job, team. <sighs> That's something, Finta. These bad boys get sold out quick, so if you want one, don't wait. Link it to the aid script. Eh. Ugh. And another reason, if you're not sold yet, despite the fact that this is the best cup in the world, they sold out quickly. 30% off if you use code PewDiePie. 30%? If there's ever a time to be like, oh, if you uh, now. Now's the time, gamers. Now. You wanna be better at games or what? Can't you tell how good I am at games? It's only valid as long as the supply lasts. Don't be one of these people that wait for the supply to unlast itself. Shaker is $9.99. But also, we got a new PewDiePie tub. That's right, it's Floor Gang flavor now. It's the same flavor as before, but even better. How do we improve the recipe? We changed nothing because you can't improve perfection, gamers. We just changed the package. I drink this every day. I love G Fuel. It's legitimately the best. It tastes good. You hydrate. You epic gamer. What else could you want? What, you're still drinking canned drinks? That's awesome because we sell those too. I don't know what they. It's a delicious G Fuel flavor and it's 30% off. Check it out, gamers. Link Babamba. Book review. Book review. Why is he wearing headphones? Shut up. Anyway, um. I'm sorry. I'm horribly late. I am so late. I've been busy, okay? I also planned this very, very poorly, okay? <laughs> uh, we read Epictetus Discourses and selected writings. Did you love it? Did you hate it? What would you rate it? Not many people complained that I was so late, so I assume no one read it. <laughs> <laughs> the five people that actually did. Be like, bruh. Can you say epic titties without giggling like a schoolgirl? It's got epic and tits in it. That's hilarious. I picked this book because it's fairly simple. It's straightforward. And it's a good introduction to Stoic philosophy. Um, there's probably better examples, but this is what I chose. I really, really like this book. Um, it's one of the few books that make me feel fortunate as a... Sounds a bit cringe almost to say, but fortunate as a human to be able to experience. I, I really mean that. I don't care if it's cringe actually. Not just for its content, but also the fact that it did survive, which is not to be taken for granted. Earlier works of Stoics like uh, Chrysippus didn't survive. And this has been around for 2000 years, so that's great. It was written by Aaron, who was Epictetus' student, and he wrote down his teacher's words word for word. And I assumed he just thought, hey, this is epic. I'm gonna write this down. Other people might have some use of this. Uh, fun fact, Aaron also wrote Alexander the Great's autobiography. It's kind of funny how everything in the Greek canon seems to be so connected. I said this before, but and you probably know. Um, Plato learned from Socrates. And Aristotle studied in a Plato school. Alexander the Great was taught by Aristotle. It's just... And in this book as well, there's many great anecdotes from Diogenes, which I made a video about as well, which was unexpected and really, really fun. So the more you dwell into it, the more you get out of it. And I really love that. And the reason I brought this up as well is because Stoicism takes its roots or its beginnings around the time of Aristotle's death. And it heavily derives from Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. But I would say the main difference, there are obviously a couple, is that uh, Stoicism is philosophy more as a way of life. I've explained this before, but the general explanation I hear about what Stoicism is, it's become fairly popular recently, is that there are things in life that you can control and there are things in life that you can't control. And whatever you can't control, you shouldn't let bother you. They shouldn't uh, make you feel angry or sad. And I think that's a good example because it's something that most people can relate to already or you've taken this into practice maybe without naturally without even thinking about it it's easier to cope or deal with things if we recognize well this is out of my control i can't do anything about about it if you miss the bus one day maybe you think instead of getting upset about it you can try and appreciate getting a good walk 
positive thinking, everyone. Uh, that's not really stoicism, but it, I mean, in a sense, stoicism is that for everything, which sometimes might seem as a bit extreme, but it's also in every sense necessary to be free as an individual, to be truly free, which we'll get into later. I think these smaller examples are good, and if we would let any single thing that doesn't go our way bother us, then we would just live life in constant distress. And according to Epictetus, being angry or feeling sorrow are just not useful emotions, because he says, when did anger, however, ever teach someone to play music or pilot a ship? Do you imagine that anger is going to help teach me the far more complex business of life? Well, it won't. Um, so in the sense that there are things in life that we can and we can't control, uh, the book actually starts off in book one, Discourses, with concerning what is in our power and what is not. And Epictetus begins to explain that we naturally unbound ourselves to things, bound to these headphones for seemingly no reason, but wanting to cover up my hair. Uh, I'm, <laughs> fuck. I'm bound to this camera because uh, I needed to film this video. I'm bound to the computer. I'm bound to this desk and this chair. This is where the whole floor gang meme come from. I don't need it technically. But also we bound ourselves to maybe even other people, friends and uh, family and our children, we see them as sort of an extension of ourselves. But according to Epictetus, because we bound ourselves to many things, they depress us and they weigh us down. And he starts off by giving a smaller example. If we want to sail and we look out to the sea and the wind isn't blowing in our favor, we look out to sea and torment ourselves, hoping that the wind will change again. Uh, but what really is it to us? It is not in our power to control nature. And, and these things that we bound ourselves to, we sort of feel a sense of ownership of, but we don't own any of it. You may think you own your house, but at any point, um, I mean, unlikely, but it could get destroyed. Your friends and family could pass away at any moment, and so can you. Uh, or they could leave and so can you and um, it goes as far as even your own body doesn't belong to you because as you may control control it in a sense you also can't control it being in perfect health you can't make it perform exactly as you wish so from that logic it doesn't belong to you and this is easier to see with smaller things like okay I don't own this book uh, sure, <laughs> but it's important to grasp for everything, not just to avoid sorrow and pain, but to also to develop your own personal freedom, which is my favorite part of the book and uh, a surprising piece that really, yeah, we'll get into that later. So just because we can't control these things or the outcome of them, that doesn't mean you can en can't enjoy them or that you can't participate or even influence the world. Uh, it's rather recognizing that that's a difficult thing to do, uh, changing people's minds, for example. But I would argue that as Stoic even appreciate, in a sense, things further because they see them for what they really are, according to its nature. And according to nature is a phrase that you hear a, a lot of in Stoicism. A Stoic's goal is, after all, to live life according to nature. And to put it simply, this means that uh, you see the world for what it is, and therefore you accept it. You accept age, you accept loss, you accept death. Everything from simple to the weather. So on this principle of living according to nature, you might ask then, well, why shouldn't I just live like whatever I please? Why shouldn't I not just fill myself with food or drink or give in to any sensational pleasure that I want? Well. Be, that's because we may not control all these other things, but the only thing that we control is our will. And that is what controls our actions. So let's say, for example, crazy example. I enjoy maybe drinking whiskey in the evening. Uh, that might satisfy a desire that you have, but ultimately you are, all, you are bound to that desire then. And according to Epictetus, we should try and eliminate our desires because otherwise we are bound to them and otherwise our actions is really the only thing that we can control. In book one, there's a really good quote. It says, I must die. Must I then die lamenting? I must be put in chains. Must I then also lament? I must go into exile. Does any man then hinder me from going with smiles and cheerfulness and contentment? Tell me the secret which you possess. I will not, for this is in my power, but I will put you in chains. Man, what are you talking about? Me in chains? You may fatter my leg, but my will, not even Zeus himself, can overpower. 
So again, whatever is in our own action is what we ultimately have power over or ownership of. And, and no one, not even the gods, in a sense, can take that away from us. This is, according to Epictetus, the most supreme gift that we are given as humans. And uh, it's the only thing that we have that examines itself, what it is and, and what power it has. And through our will and developing of reason, which we gain when we get older, we see things differently and we act differently because of it. Some people can live life without being disturbed by certain events, other people struggle more or less. And what action we take through an, an event is through our opinion of that thing. He gives the example here of Achilles. This then was the cause of Achilles' lamentations. Not the fact that Patroclus died, since other people don't carry on so when a friend or companion dies, but the fact that he chose to lament. So this example is from Homer's Iliad where Achilles uh, lost his best friend Patroclus. You may have heard of, you probably know Achilles already. And he's, he's famous for being this ultimate warrior and the only weakness he had was his heel. Uh, but I, I guess you could say that according to Epictetus, his weakness wasn't uh, his heel, but his opinion that it, that was his fault. Because his view on, on death was not according to nature. And he gives uh, another great quote that sort of ties into that. Because this might, I recognize this might seem very harsh or... or um, crude to impose on someone's view on death uh, but <clears> he <throat> says you wish for these things in winter you are a fool so if you wish for your son or your friend when it's not allowed to you you must know that you are wishing for a fig in winter for such as winter is to a fig such is every event which happens from the universe to the things which are taken away according to its nature and further at the times when you are delighted with a thing place before yourself the contrary appearances what harm is it while you are kissing your child to say with a lisping voice, tomorrow you will die, and to a friend also, tomorrow you will go, or I shall, and never shall we see one another again. Again, according to Epictetus, anger and, and sorrow are just emotions that will not help us through life. And it's not to suppress these emotions and sort of hold them in, but it's rather by seeing things for what they are, you accept them instead of trying to fight it or bargain with it. Arguing against nature is something that you do as a child because you haven't yet developed that reason and and only a child would ask for a fig in winter. A stoic is always aware of death. They sort of live, you could, I guess you could say, near death. So by seeing thing according to its nature, that opinion of death might seem heavy or, or overbearing almost uh, to be constantly aware of it. But it's also very liberating. Epictetus gives the example of Diogenes as a man who was truly free. Because everything he owned he could dispose of and was only temporarily attached to him. Uh, he says, if you grabbed him by the leg, he would have given up the leg. If you had seized his entire body, the entire body would have been sacrificed. The same with family, friends, and country. He knew where they had come from, from whom and on what terms. So Diogenes knew that these things didn't belong to him, so he was also then free from them, while still being able to enjoy them. <laughs> If you imagine a free person, you might imagine someone with a lot of wealth, a lot of power, uh, they can do what they want, they can go wherever they want, uh, they can control people, but you could still argue that they are humble to their wealth. Uh, money can give freedom, but they can also bound you to it, and then ultimately, in that same sense, being a slave to it. Because if something were to happen with it, and if you're, or if you're awake at night worried that something might happen to all the money you have, you then also don't have an opinion according to its nature, and you are also not free from it. Epictetus himself was a slave during his life, so he must have thought about this a lot uh, on the theme of freedom, and I think he knew that his opinion was not a popular one. He says that he, if you tell someone that they are just as enslaved as someone sold to captivity, don't expect anything but a punch in the nose. <laughs> and I think it's a reality that we don't like to admit. Uh, we prefer to see ourselves as free individuals, even if it might seem like we are. Or, But in general, we are all bound to certain things. So in, from a stoic sense, you are not. We sometimes even let our actions be bound to n not things, but the opinion that other people have of it. Maybe you picked your job or your school or your partner through opinion. Aren't you a slave to other people's opinion then? So according to Epictetus, you can be a slave, but still be a free man. As long as your actions are free and as long as you're not bound to anything. That's what really makes the difference. And I think that's a, a hopeful and liberating view on the world, I would say. Um, 
life is just full of things that you can't control but to try and focus on your own views and your own opinions to liberate yourself there's to me a lot of power in that there are so many great pieces of this book and i feel like i could just read quote after quote after quote until i just read the whole book i highly recommend it it's just filled with so many great parts I wanted to finish by reading just uh, my favorite bit, which is just a small sentence in, in the very, very end, because it, it resonates heavily with me. Let someone point out to me a man who can say, I care only about the things which are my own, the things which are not subject of hindrance, the things which are by nature free. This I hold to be the nature of the good, but let all other things be as they are allowed. I do not concern myself. That's it. Epic Titus Discourse and Selector Writing. Check it out. What did you think of it? Did you read it? I would love to hear your guys' thoughts. Uh, did you get the same ideas from me that I had or something completely different? Uh, next week, uh, it will not be next week, but next book, we're gonna read Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, The Wisdom of Life. I recently discovered Schopenhauer. He's great, really fun to read, and I think you guys will enjoy him as well if you enjoy philosophy or reading in general. It's a fun one, I like it. He's a goofy guy. And that's it. Hope you guys enjoyed. See you next time. Bye bye.